G'day listeners, well, welcome to Bar Karate, the sailing podcast. My name's Jordan Spence and it's that time of the week where we get to hang out with some really cool sailors. But of course I have to share the mic with my two idiot mates. Yet again, it's only one, it's soon, we promise, it's soon. But let's bring in the other bloke. He had a voice that could make a wolverine purr. Mr Nick Boss. Bossy. Um, apologies to the listeners. Had a few calls today, um, <laughs> which is we're recording on a Monday night. We normally put the pot out on a Sunday night, but mm. things just got 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 in the way. Father's Day, daughter's birthday, a few things. Um, speaking of which, mm. you're a wise man, Jordan. <laughs> Why? If there's one bit of advice you always gave me was never leave a forwarding address. Yes. So I'm guessing... <laughs> You probably didn't get many cards yesterday, <laughs> so congratulations on that. Yes, um, but I've got fun. a couple of stats for you. Despite your um, little poker bit of fun at the uh, at the defender breaking down, yeah, I'll have you know I was away in the defender over mm. the weekend. Mm. Um, I've got a couple of stats. Okay, um, pulled out two Toyotas that were bogged <laughs> on the beach. Right. Um, I did see a Mazda. So I actually, instead of pulling it out, I pushed the piece of shit into the water <laughs> and just watched it drown. <laughs> I wonder where my car went. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, good to be here, mate. Another massive uh, week in yachting. It's all oh, firing up in so Europe much. at the minute, coming to the end of the summer, yeah. um, which we'll delve into later. Mm. Um, and it's all kind of kicking off here in Oz too with a couple of opening days um, just happened. So, yeah. Indeed. We're in for a busy, busy month or so. Yeah, no, no slack in this next month. Um, cool. Well, let's bring our guest in because uh, I'm looking forward to this one. I reckon this will be a lot of fun. We've got a long history with this bloke and uh, we've made uh, we've made reference to him a few times on the show. Um, his illustrious uh, figure as he, he sits astride his vessel and with his tattooed mane and he looks so heroic in his action. Um, may, the reason- may I just say... Yeah. Possibly the second, I'll say second best, second best ink in the yachting game. Oh. <laughs> he won a good ink game. Plus. Plus. Got to be one of the best mullets. <laughs> he rolled a bloody good mullet during the uh, last edition of the Volvo Ocean Race. Uh. And... I mean, he pretty much set a trend worldwide with that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, well, I guess this week is a man who lives life to the fullest. He's a man of passion and uh, he he's, you know, just genuinely trying to do the right thing all the time and, and, and the good thing. And he um, – I was thinking about this while you're away, landlocked or broken down in your Defender. I was thinking we need to – When you look at the people working in the sailing world, the sailing jobs are outnumbered by the people behind the scenes. And so Mm. I thought, you know, we really need to talk to some of these guys just to find their pathway. And so this guy obviously came to mind. He's done a couple of America's Cups, a couple of Volvo Ocean races, um, and he's now currently with the Sail GP, with uh, um, Great Britain Sail GP team, uh, and... You know, he's got an amazing life as well, it's just from the interesting pathway and things that he's done in his life, you know, like he's married to a dolphin trainer, uh, which I find quite hilarious, a, a, a dolphin trainer from Chile. Um, but he's, and the, you know, very passionate, loving relationship there um, and just an all-round good guy. I've always enjoyed his time. So uh, let's welcome to the show Henry Woodhouse. How are you, bud? Hey, gents, how are you? Yeah, good to be on here. Thanks for the intro. <laughs> oh, mate, that, to I had to, I had to yeah. cut him off a few times. <laughs> you should have seen the run sheet, mate. As long as your arm. <laughs> oh, mate. You, you know how to make a man blush. T- tell, us tell us where you're at. Tell us where you're at. The front and the party at the back, though. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, you've got to keep that real. Absolutely. Keep I want to see the square, the square sides a bit, if you could. You know? The square sides. Yeah, just like what the kids are doing these, the these days. Yeah, Jake, above the year. Gotta, yeah, I like yeah, it. Yeah, you've got to keep it. Got, got a sick fade going on. Hang there, on. You know? I'm uh, just doing a screenshot. 
Yep, that'll go on the website. <laughs> All clear. <laughs> run the moulet. Run the, we're in France, aren't we? So it's got to be a moulet here. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. None of this yeah. mullet behaviour, the moulet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get the old moulet out. But yeah, no, good. Hey, uh, Great to be on here, yeah. Spe- Speaking me. of France, where are you? What's the current uh, situation? Current situation, pretty, pretty shitty down here at the minute. I'll just zoom out. Uh, yeah, we've got the, uh, you see the start marks down in Saint Tropez, preparing for the uh, Cell GP event down here. Uh, yeah, hopefully we can uh, we can improve on the last event and and take off where we sh- where we should be in the leaderboard. Yeah, mate. I've got a load of voices. <laughs> That's Parker, Parker giving me Parker giving me shit for uh. my mullet in the moulet, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. Parker's always in the background when we're doing stuff at the moment. He's he's here quite. We've got guest appearance here live on the show. We've got Parker right live. Parker, oh, coffee so, in hand, ready to roll. Good, 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 yeah. good snack, good snack routine. Going bit, on. bit of scrogging <laughs> down there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I love it. Nice work. Love it. All good. I um I, I guess you know you've when we talk about last week we have to we have to how, how busy have you been over the last couple of weeks, mate, with uh, doing a few repairs? Yeah, yeah. Like, like, luckily, most of it was just absolute so broken that it was beyond repair, and it was just putting new parts in. So okay, that kind of saved a lot of work on those. So I'd obviously, lucky luck, luck's luck's a very broad word to put in this situation. <laughs> The um yeah uh, the dagger ball was complete snaps rudder was snapped at stock and the case was also broken that was the extent of our damage uh, we've had to get a new case from one of the spares pool and and uh, new dagger ball and a new rudder and we're just putting all that together and making sure it fits all 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 tickety boo as they say and yeah we should be good for sailing on Thursday no yeah cool problems. that's good to so hear. big thanks to the tech team and what they do and getting behind us because we've got massive support from the tech team. As I know, working with you, Bicey, in the boatyard over, over time, you know, it's, it's a massive asset that some people overlook sometimes. And especially, like you said, Jordan, yourself, people behind the scenes that people don't really know how hard they work and they really do make this show go, you know. What um, dag, is it port or starboard dagboard? It's all starboard. Starboard, starboard uh, dagboard. Starboard, starboard I was going to say, so. if it was the port one, you could give her a little tweak just for a bit more pace off the start line. <laughs> well, uh, that was, that was thought, you that are was in the, France, the, so... Uh, why not? <laughs> or that but you know, just to get round the course. But obviously, that wasn't the case to be. Um, <laughs> the issue that it can't can't really be yeah. avoided. Yeah. Well, well, before we get too deep into that, let's let's get into you, mate. Um, you. Yeah, please. Um, you obviously came to the sport through your dad. So in the family, you know, like sailing was in the family. Yeah. Yeah, dad was dad was a massive massive sailor. Uh, so not not so much in the modern racing era, but on the farm of classic working boats. Who used to, mm. you know, they dredge. I think it's the only stretch of water in the world that they still legally have to dredge the oysters under sail uh, oh. down in Falmouth and Cornwall, England, and they still do that now. So they will work the winters. They'll be there at two, three o'clock in the morning, you know, first light, getting up there, getting ready, and they'll dredge no matter what what the weather or winter. And then in the summer, yeah. those boats turn into race boats, and there's wow. racing all around the Falmouth Harbour with the big colourful tops. And yeah, I those, and then through sailing down at down in Cornwall, and uh, yeah, and took it from there. No, never did too much racing but always was involved in boats and around the scene that's that's cool i never knew about that so they 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 dredge the the oysters with the boats under sail that's that's unreal just uh, yeah. it's a pretty pretty out there skill you know pretty pretty hard thing to do especially up the estuaries there and the Helford and around the Falmouth waters and the, the carrick roads as they call it it's pretty impressive can't wait to tell andy dyer that there you go. Mm, well, <laughs> I'm just pop, thinking. Pop shit. You can win some money off that one. <clears throat> a bit um, like if you're from the Solent, you're a bowman and a navigator at the same time because you're looking out for all sorts of shit. If you're from yeah. Falmouth, you're a navigator and a trawler at the same time. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you can back you can back down those boats pretty well, I reckon, when they're trawlers. <laughs> and so you went from obviously, and then some stage you rolled into racing because you did the opti thing. Um, it's, uh, yeah, exactly. Young age racing, and then 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 not. I didn't like my pathway in racing. It was more oppy racing, and then I kind of went a little bit rogue in my teenage years, um, and then I ended up joining the military and did quite a, quite a lot of keelboat racing in the military, right. um, but more weekends, you know. Um, 
you know, I'm not I'm not a, a mega racer. You know, I've done a bit and lots of deliveries and offshore stuff, but you know, it's more more of a seaman than the seamanship style style that's helped me get to where I've got to now with the, within the within the trade and having a, a good mind in engineering and things like that. I think's helped and just kind of pick things up as I've gone. The boat boatyard was a massive thing for me. Pathways wise, you know, the boatyard I went in there as a boat builder working under Timmy Collin and Vicey and Neil Cox, who took over in the second edition. And to see your beautiful head all the time, Jordan, walking around the race village and hearing your voice from far, far away. It's a big one. Uh, but yeah, but basically it gave us an opportunity to, because, you know, when you were quiet in the, in the boat building side of it, there was the riggers that were there, there was the hydro guys, there was the electrics, and you could just walk into each other. It was such a family, you know, you could just walk into each other's department and, and pick, up, pick up and learn, you know, and that was a great thing for me that helped me. Put, in, put myself in a position as a boat captain for the RC44s and then with this and doing not just the boat building but the mechanic side of it and now the hydrofoil systems and um, yeah so that that was a massive massive stepping stone for me I think and and being a keen learner and uh, not really being worried about too many things I think it helped yeah well, mm. I, I guess back, back to the back to the military quickly um, yeah. before actually your rank and position sergeant um <laughs> The <laughs> the actual uh, the sailing you did with them that it's quite big in the UK. Like the different programs yeah. in place. Yeah, there's, lo- there's loads. There's loads of like cruising offshore. Each 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 base has its own like club that you can, and they have a fleet of boats. So it's great. There's lots of opportunities, especially doing offshore stuff and getting your yacht masters done and things like that. Um, and then you have you know I think there's quite a few teams that then go to compete in in a lot of events. You you often see. I know down in the Whitbread, there was almost almost always a, mm. a military, military team of some sort, yeah. whether it was from the Navy, military, yeah, para, paras, marines. Unfortunately, I never got the opportunity to do that, but <clears throat> it's definitely a big sailing ground, and well, especially in the Navy, obviously being a maritime force, it's 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 uh, they they encourage it a lot, so that's good. And um, obviously, the military took you quite a bit around the UK, but how about the rest of the world? Yeah. Plenty. To be honest, doing more around the rest of the world than on the UK. I, I actually joined joined the Navy when I was eighteen. Um, I did a flew straight out to the Gulf of Arabia, doing non-compliant boardings on oil smugglers coming out of the of the Iraqi the Straits of Hormuz through there mm. and the 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 um, territorial waters. They basically follow the smugglers would come out of Iraq and follow the waters down, but because of the draft of the ship in certain areas, they had to come into international waters. And that's where we'd be following down, tracking them down, and we'd pounce with a helicopter insurgent, fast roping down, and then you have the fast ribs that would come alongside. And by that stage, they're obviously doing a 180 and steaming back to Iranian waters, and you've got to make them stop the ship before they get back into those Iranian waters, otherwise you got a bit on. But, um, <laughs> so that was interesting. That's, that's when I worked with the Royal Marines commandos, and that's when I was like, that's what I want to do. And I, I started, did a full circle after doing 18 months in the Navy and took myself back to basic training and started all over again as a Royal Marine Commando. Did the basic training and then joined 40 Commando. Went away with them on a few tours um, of Iraq was uh, with, the, with the biggest biggest tour. And then apart from that, lots of traveling around the world, doing training in different parts and generally having a bloody good time. Uh, well, so, really like a weekend millionaire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what what was the coolest thing you did as a commando? I, I think the like one of the first things and one of the last things to to do, uh, like actually doing like fast roping out helicopters. You know, it's pretty fucking cool. You, you <laughs> sorry, it's pretty cool. You got you got two player. You got a, you like a pair of leather gloves and then a pair of welding gloves over the top. You've got your full fighting unit on, and you literally are controlling your ascent rate by the, your grip strength. Yep. Some obviously better than mm. others with that grip strength. Sure. And, um, <laughs> and you basically turn out of the out of the helicopter, and you just and you say you're as fat, you're as fast as your brave bravest. And obviously, some lads are a little bit too brave and uh, to end up breaking their legs and things like that in mm. training. Mm. And also, when the ship's moving, and it's coming up and down. Obviously, you know, so it's quite a tricky mm. thing to do. Um, whereas you get the SEALs and the Delta Force, they come out and they're on harnesses and they're very controlled, but this is just literally by hand, yeah, yeah. hand strength and down. So that was a really cool thing to do. Obviously, lots of, lo- lots of other cool things going on, like the live firing in Nevada desert and, you know, just generally playing with machine guns and big arms is pretty, pretty fun um, to do it safely, obviously. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But the lads, the lads in general, like and that, this is one joy of the sailing world that I found is there's 
the lads and the banter that you get, like you guys leading the way and that, you know, at Bar Karate, it, it's, it, it's second to none, you know, you've got, band, you know, it's a little bit of a different level with the Marines because you've got the band of brothers kind of thing. You'll do anything for mm-hmm. you. You'll have a beer with them at the end of the day, you know, whether you like them or not, because you know that they're, 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 they're willing to do anything for you and vice versa. Which may not be the case so much in the sailing world, but <laughs> you've got but you've got a, a good banter, you know, and it's it, it's it's uh, it's a different level, you know, but it's very similar in that sense. Uh, that was really cool, you know. There's one thing that I probably miss more than anything was is is that that le- that level of friendship that you get. Mm. Mm. Now, can I ask the next obvious question? And seeing we've yeah. dropped the f bomb already, I'll drop it. How yeah. the fuck did you become a boat builder? Oh. From all uh, of that. How the fuck did I become a boat builder? Well, always interested in sailing, obviously. Left the Marines. I had a friend who was in the military from Cornwall that was actually building infurling booms for Perini Navi in Italy. And it just so happened I was talking to another guy who was doing a bit of fairing and I didn't really know what to do. I was going to go into private security and do bodyguarding. But it's kind of the whole, one of the reasons I left the military was to get away from the whole institutional side of it and be your own man sort of thing and not what they're molding you to be, which isn't a bad thing to some people, but wasn't working for me at the time. Um, and he was like, mate, if you come and work for me, I'll pay you. The military are paying you and you're basically doing work experience. And so I was getting like basically triple pay because I was getting paid by him. I was getting my, my leaving the military pay and plus the actual standard pay. So it was basically money basically became, brought me into boat building and the, and the love of the sport. But, um, and you can imagine the first job I was inside a 12 meter boom doing wet laminating of a furling mm. arm thinking, <laughs> what am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> in my combat, in my military, because I had no other work clothes. So I turned up, <laughs> someone reminded me this the other day, in my, in my combat trousers, in my combat shirt, like like fresh out of the military, they're yeah. like this laminate in the way, wet lamb, absolutely covered in Ampreg 22, wondering why I'm getting angry with everyone. <laughs> Ampregged up. No mask, neither, you know, because back in the day, it was just like, yeah, tough, tough guy that doesn't want to wear a mask. Um, yeah, and did that, and then did a few race boats, and then went to New Zealand, worked with Hakes Marine, actually, out in Petoni yeah. in Wellington. And that's where I started actually getting into the race boat and realised, yeah, this is this is a, a lot a lot lot more fun. And got myself into the shore crew um, with Dong Feng for the first edition of the sixty five Volvo. Um, yeah, and just was a sponge and just tried to learn everything I can about all the other departments. And I, I seemed to keep like, getting drawn towards the mechanics and the winch kind of side of it. And yeah, and then working with the RC forty fours and going to the America's Cup as a boat builder as well. And yeah, and it was just. Once I found the shore crew side of it, it, it was a new, it gave me a new kind of lease of life within the sailing industry because it was getting a little bit much being in a boatyard for me, mm. uh, you know, each own, but I was well, much as more. You, much as happy. you know, Henry, there's, a, and I think I've said it quite a few times on the show, there's um, a lot of really good boat builders in the world, but to be a good boat builder and a shore crew at the same time, because you got all those different elements, like you're living in sure. each other's back pockets, you're, your your wife or girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever it is, they're all living with everyone as well. So it's a yeah. big fair. And some people just don't fit into it, but um, you you fit in that mold pretty well. Yeah, and I think like like say ex military, like it's it's what you're used to. You're living on top of each other. You're living. You're mm. organised. You're on time. You know you can you can handle your piss and get to turn up to work the next day, which is an important yeah. factor as you as you as we all know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, no, no, definitely. It, it takes a little bit more of a diverse person to be able to, you know, not, not, this is my job and that's all I'm going to do. It's like, you know, he's been open-minded and come and help me with this or go, see someone struggling going, you know, even if it's like, this is one of the joys of CellGP as well is, you know, everyone's just helping each other and you see someone struggling a little bit, like, whereas the cup is very, very secluded, very secretive. And, you know, it's, 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 it's in that, that is one of the things that's really nice about CellGP, you know. Mm. Mm. By the way, I got a message while you two have been talking from Peter Goggin saying thank you very much for the contribution to the uh, swear jar. Um, Bill, who pays that? No, P- Peter. <laughs> Peter, his son. Card, that... Bill's son, Peter. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, young yeah. Pedro. Yeah, young Pedro, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, yeah, like, so, I mean, it's quite the adventure, mate. Like, when you started out, were you nervous? Were you certain that it was going to work out? Or was it just like, oh, I'll just see where it goes to next? Uh, 
Yeah, I, I, I must admit, the most nervous I've been is speaking, build up to speaking to you two today and wondering <laughs> how you're going to try and speak up. <laughs> Probably the point, most nervous point in my career. But no, generally, no, not really, mate. I, I, was, I was lucky that it was a couple of guys I knew that I was working with and when I was into it. And obviously everyone has those fear, you know, those nerves or fears or that oh, imposter syndrome. Am I good enough? Can I do this? Am I, am I going to mess it up? Or, um, but... I think just being quite a confident, outgoing person, it kind of, it, I was just, yeah, maybe broke it with trying to be funny and that was about, that was my way. Plus, of plus the to, intimidating uh, ink as well. That does a yeah, lot to it. Yeah. yeah. Got a thing to scare people, you know. Got to make yeah. Me, uh, and if it gets a bit too far, just whip the shirt off, just flash the rig around a bit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Start washing my, my dunnies in, in, in my, on my six pack, you know. <laughs> I love it. So, um, during that time, before we kind of dig into exactly what you're doing now, you've worked at yep. a few boat yards along the way. Any, yep. like, be it Hakes and Persico, whomever it is, a lot of different cultures to deal with, but all producing some pretty fine results. Any highlights and lowlights in that journey? Um, Yeah, I suppose they're all they're all really good to work for. Persco, you know, Hakes was was very much you know a good Kiwi boat builders that was you know very family orientated. We'd like you say your beers on a Friday, barbecues every Friday, and that was you know that was really nice to be down there and explore New Zealand and learn, getting more opportunities that I think I would have got at, at European boat yards by just putting myself out there and just going right, phoning up Hakes and going look, can, can I come out and did it off my own back and got more opportunity to build race boats which was great for great for me mm. where at the time i was before super yacht kind of things and that kind of give me that opening into the race shots and give me some experience in that and then going to persco you know persco is an amazing um an amazing yard that's got absolutely everything now is capable of producing all sorts um the highlights are always the, the people you know good people hanging out with good people uh and having ha- having spinning yarns and uh obviously low lights you could say that sometimes the workload and the build up to things and then going to some night shifts and I'd say one of the, one of the biggest, biggest, uh, can't drop the F board bomb. Can I do it? One of the biggest, uh, failures I'd say in my boat building career was being involved in the Luna Rossa foils that they, they built in Persco and straight into there in a night shift, built the foils. They had these like massive mechanical arms to trim the, trim the, the, mm. the tips. Yeah. Went, to, went, to, went, went to put it into the, Board cases didn't fit. Oh. So it was but two guys working. Oh, these are this was for the 70, 70, uh, 72. 72. Yeah. So they were big foils. Two night, two, 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 two weeks of guys in night shifts basically sabering, sawing the middle down this foil to then take a section out of it to then glue it back together to make oh. it fit in the board case. Wow. Glorious. And had Max Serena flying in. You had. Bertelli flying in the helicopter. I think there was a football match going on and Nembro there, and he just flew in with his helicopter, landed right in the middle of the pitch. What's going on? You imagine these <laughs> Italian, Italian characters screaming and shouting at each other, and we're like, just like, we were just doing as we told. But, and then, uh, yeah, and then they didn't even use the foils. <laughs> so, <laughs> no. uh, it's like, you know, that was like so much work and effort going into it, and then they get packed off and they didn't even use them. But, you know, but. It happens. I'm sure there's been bigger, bigger and worse ones, but you know, I think that was a uh, that was in the early days where, but but it was yeah, that was that was quite a shocker. Mm. Oh, that that was a bit of a loaded question, I must admit, because I knew the answer would be as far as highlights are concerned, that the people and the different teams you work with and building that camaraderie, yeah. in the sense that you could probably run into either one, any one of those dudes around the world now that you worked with at some point in time and you've got that bit in common and you have a good chat and you had good banter at the time, right? Exactly. I think a lot, a lot of people in work, they have a, uh, they have a, what's it it called? Not accomplishments. They have um, acquaintances, you know, Mm. and they they work with them, but they never really hang with them out with them outside of work, you know, sailing outside the sailing industry. Whereas the sailing industry, you could, you could, you could, you can know, you could work with someone, you get them really well, you have a crack with them, and then but then when you meet them somewhere else, it's you know it's just take off where you left off, and it's and you, you know and then if something happens to you and you've had a say you've had a shocker on the, on the water or something like that, you you get messages from people that you just don't you know don't expect to is it and that that's why I was going back to that whole leaving the military and having that band of brothers, good, grunt, bunch of mates, you know that really that really is a 
what you get in the sailing industry and that, that's definitely one of the highlights for sure for me being able mm. to find that outside of the military it's cool yeah. it's cool so you know you've you've continued what I, I find interesting is that you know it's never an ongoing role you know like wh- when you go down this pathway you don't know when it's going to come to an end you know like the the boatyard looked like it was just going to continue on. It was a great success. The race was unreal. And then it yeah. disappeared. I guess I just – yeah, it sort of disappeared. And then what I, I guess I was trying to say is that, you know, you don't know what's happening next. You know, you've got a wife, you've got a couple of kids – and you think, oh, where's the money going to come from next? But for you, you know, you've just continued on better and better and better. So, like, do you ever – does any of that stuff ever get you nervous or you've always been you've always been sorted? I've kind of grown to, to, to get used to it. And it's like I was talking to Steph the other day, you know, because things, things happen in the yachting industry. And it seems like – like, we, we, I moved my whole family to Portugal after living down there with a the boatyard. We did the race. My family came with me. It was great, amazing experience. We thought there was going to be super 60s and we were going to be down in, uh, and we were like, right, let's move back to Portugal. Didn't happen, unfortunately. But I'd kind of phased out, which is a, a damn shame. Um, and I'm like, I'm, I've moved my whole family to Portugal. I'm here. There's, there's no real work. There's lots of work in Portugal, but not really on the on the level that uh, of salary wise and pay and things like that. You know, that's good for the family, obviously. Um, and it's, you know, and you're like, shit, what am I going to do? Mm. And, like, and, I'm, and it, but, I was kind of relaxed about it, but over the years you get to that point where you're like, it, it kind of, there's nothing and you think, you think you've got nothing and all of a sudden you, you've got four different things coming up, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, there's definitely, uh, there's definitely some, uh, some nerves to deal with. Um, but I've kind of learned, learned over the, over the years that it, something will work, will come, something will come. Yeah. Well, it, it, and it always has. At least, you know, you're living, living in Portugal, which is a fantastic place. And it's been, yeah, and you know you can go surfing. You and Rob off, young Robert off surfing and living that sort of lifestyle. And you know, dollar. You- oh, gee, it's great. I'm basically semi-retired. I come away and work, and I go home, drop the boy off at school, go surfing, make sure the wife's all right, maybe do some work on the house, go home, hang out with a lad after school, or do his clubs or whatever, and yeah, and back yeah. away working again. Yeah, not yeah. not to uh, forget. Go to the best chicken shop in the world, Don Manolo's. <laughs> Down Don Manolo's, mate. Down the Frango. <laughs> Going chips. Uh, Righto. Okay. So all, all of that has has got you to this position now. You're sitting in front of us in Saint Tropez. Um, not only is um, like looking at all the systems and the boat building side, but you're also one of the divers. Yeah, so I, I joined when I joined SailGP to start. I joined. It was a, a bit of a different team from what it is now, and I joined as one of the one of the boat builder straight mechanics because I'd done a little bit of winch work and stuff. And I was I was uh, a boat captain for the RC44 Charisma with a bunch mm-hmm. of very good men on the boat. Um, and we did the first season. The, there was a takeover by the Ineos um, team, and like, the, and then all shore crews were reduced down, so they needed more diverse people. Because in the first season, there was a diver, there was a foil guy, there was a mechanics guy, there was a boat builder, there was a shore boss, there was a chase boat driver. You know, so that they were pretty, pretty stocked up on shore crew. And then when the they, they basically made the tech team became bigger, the, the teams themselves become smaller, and there's only three shore crew. Uh, as a as a general rule of thumb on most teams, some got some people have brought in younger like apprentices, to, so they've got a fourth. Uh, and at that time, I was like, didn't really know if I was going to have my job or anything because the role was going to need to be a diver or a bit more of a diverse role. I wasn't sure where that where I was going to fit in there. Um, and I just shaped and but from day one week one, I was always asking about the diving role and if we could have a secondary diver, I'd be really keen on that. You know, it's something that really appealed to me. Um, and yeah, and then when it came came to it, um, I spoke to my good friend Chris Draper about I sent him an email and reminding him about my military background and I'd done diving and I had diving experience and obviously been involved in some conflicts as well. So you know, hopefully quite quite good under pressure. Um, yeah, and put it to him. I was like, employ me, mate. Give me this job. I can do it. This is this is all about me. I can still do the four mechanics and, uh, and the system, the bearing systems and stuff. I can still do a lot around the boat. I know the boats. I've done a season, and I'm a diver, and I can learn quickly. And yeah, luck, luck, luckily, luckily, uh, it it came back, and and I was and I got given the role, which is is absolutely 
I actually thrive off it. I'm, I'm absolutely frothing, as they say, to be part <laughs> yeah. of the world. Um, yeah, it's, it's great. And it's, it's almost like over the years of being a boat builder and then being involved in other things and shore crew and like developing my skill set. Um, but then always having a little bit of a, you know, in the military, you're on the, they could say you're on the pointy end, you know, you're at the front, you're in the fr- front line and, you, you know, you don't, you don't, you find, it's hard to find that in general day-to-day life, civilian life, uh, you know, sailing, sailing world more in the racing scene, but I wasn't really in the racing scene these days. So that, that was me. Yeah. Finding, you know, I've got my, I've got my harness and I've got my knife and I've got my spare air and I get to check the guys and I've got responsibility about people's lives. And it's very much part of that that was missing from, from when I was in the military that I, that I, that I used to enjoy. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's great. So, and that's how I've felt fallen into this role. Well, like you say, make your own luck. We've talked about before, Jordan, and, and, yeah. you know, and I think that's pushing it and having confidence in yourself and just going, look, I can do this. Give me a chance and not, and taking it on. I must admit, Jordan's probably guilty of this more than me. He really ripped the piss out of you at one point in time. <laughs> he, he was basically explaining the diver and uh, within the sale GP and that Henry Woodhouse is the man. Like you could almost see him with the knife in his mouth diving in to cut someone free. Um, I must admit, I then took over at that point in time. It's not a knife. He's just got a shark. A shark tooth tied around his neck, and he uses that to cut someone free. <laughs> Even sharpen my teeth. One of my teeth. <laughs> yeah. just... So, mate, there must um, hell of, hell of a lot of training involved in that. Is it that a sale GP initiative? Like you must yeah. have someone who is trained to a certain level to be the official diver. Yeah, it's exactly, exactly that. There, there, there's there's a level that needs to be, and obviously from day one, week one, it was very new with the whole SLGP thing. And over over the years, it's developed, and they're doing a great job of making sure people have the correct first aid training that they have. They've got like a paddy rescue diver training, and also, also you know that they're, they're, the training they have on the water, the first aid is a higher level. There's trauma 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 training. We're doing. Mm started doing this season now where we go around tents and we're actually doing active training on like removing people on on spine boards and things like that and going through different scenarios making sure the safety boats all have the same amount of uh, equipment in you know, the first and they have the same equipment in the same place you know very much in the yeah. military everyone's I knew my compass in my left pocket my my tourniquet was in this pocket and that's what they're trying to standardize everything and, and make it so it is covering every uh, scenario that they can um there's also chat about uh, a fitness level coming in so being able to sw- similar to a beach lifeguard you know being mm. able to swim a certain di- swim underwater for a certain different di- distance pulling your body up you know when when i had to go in the water in cadiz because we, we we tipped it over there it, you know you have to jump in the water and you have to pull yourself up onto the from the dagger board to get to the writing lines after you've done the safety sign off of the guys the head count everyone's okay you're into the seamanship side of it uh, yeah, so it just just being able to pull your own body weight up is a massive thing that people could overlook, you know, because, you know, the same industry, sometimes it can be, oh, yeah, I know, it, mate of mine, he's a GC, you know, he can come in and do the job, but, yeah. you know, he may not have the training and, you know, it's a bit of a mate's club sometimes. Mm. Uh, and obviously, we need people to be able to uh, fulfill their role correctly. So there's, the, the, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of training going on, which, word, is, which word, is good. Word has it, Henry, that Russell's been chatting to Laird Hamilton and you're all off for a... Uh for a winter retreat to Hawaii and Laird's going to teach you some, uh, like some breath holding techniques. You got to walk along the yeah. bottom with his pole and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. That'd be good. <laughs> I don't, I'll hold, I'll hold him to that. I'll tell him that you said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know what might happen. <laughs> but I'm, I'm always keen. I'm keen for anything. It's good. Mm. Yeah, Laird, Laird's a different character, so I'm not sure I'd rush to that one, but anyway, um, the, yeah, yeah. the, the thing about the, the the rescue diver element is you've had both extremes there, my friend. You've you know you've literally have had to go into the water, um, and do the rescues, make sure you've got everyone safe, and then as you said, right the boat. But then again, you know the odd princess rolls into your your boat yard, and you uh, you get to put your harness and strap her up and and make sure she's safe. You know, like the, there's pluses and minuses, mate. How 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 did the princess go? It was great, mate. She was she was she was a lovely lovely lady. It was yeah, it, it's you know because you see her you see her on online and everything, and it's always but yeah, she was really chatty, really involved. Got in the boat, did a great job. Managed to do a safety sign off. 
told her royal ha- highness that her royal harness was ready for her. Oh. Uh, I think it Mate. kind of. But it was, I'd, I'd take the money in, too. and then obviously you put, did it. Did her safety sign off? She's obviously done safety training before. She comes on the boat like all the guests do, and then you pass them onto the boat and just treat her like any other guest. Um, but obviously, a very, very uh, in in the sense of the safety wise. Uh, put her onto the boat, told her about the safety and if anything happened, where to hold on. We've got like a bit of a brace brace position that we tell them about. Um, connected her onto a safety tether and said, passed her over to, to Ben and, and said, said um, you know, just tell Ben and he'll tell you about crossing the boat and things like that. And as I was climbing off the boat, I heard her say to Ben, is all that really going to happen? Because I was obviously <laughs> talking about capsize to hold on to and everything. And Ben's like, no, no, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Although, although in the Commonwealth game they did a race, they did have a little fruity movement going around the top mark and had a bit of a wheelie and we were like, oh, 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 no, it's all good. <laughs> but no, really good. Yeah. but no, that was a great experience. You know, and that, that's that's one of the one of the joys of this role. You know, you get to get up and close and personal with the VIPs as well as doing your day to day role and mm. meeting some cool people. Mm. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah, right up and close and personal with them. Obviously, I, I did notice. Yeah. I did notice, Henry, when she turned up, there was a couple of cops came and stood quite close to me to move me, <laughs> just make sure that stupid Aussie wasn't going to do anything. Um, yeah, so. you just probably got that face. You just look like a bit of a threat, mate, that they probably just said to move you to one side. Yeah, it's all the AI just spanning around, standing <laughs> around when it gets you. <laughs> yeah, we'll aim for this bloke. <laughs> so, all that metal you- <laughs> so with um, one of the things about... You know the way your mind works, mate, is that you know you're always looking for that that next best way to do things, looking to improve the process. And I know for a fact that you came up with this whole system where the spare air system that's on all the boats. And now, do you want to just you know, like you, yeah, sure, that's yeah, a life changer. That was, that was, yeah, that was uh, actually me and Harry McGugan, who you guys know very well. That's mm. me and mm-hmm. him. We, the project and, the, and then it, we sent it off to someone who was more capable of printing it you know he's got a mini print at home but it was basically the spare airs the, the guys have their safety vests they have their knife they have their spare air on their vest and they also and they also have in the boat we have two spare airs forward and aft on both sides so four total and at the time there were we we're always looking looking to try and improve sustainability things as well as improve the make things a bit more professional um and these spare airs were basically cable tied on in every position, you know, it was a lot, lot of cable ties being used every season. I think we worked out it was like 2,000 cable ties over the season. And that was a driving point for it for me as well, because obviously they get ditched and a lot of them end up in the sea, which is it's our about playground. How many, your average spark you would use putting a compass wire in? <laughs> oh, this is, this is, we're, we're, we're working with the sparkers closely, but they're a hard, they're a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard sell, you know. Um, <laughs> And yeah, and and so we just thought we could make it better. You know, it was it was one of those typical cable tie bases that the Sparky uses, and they, these sparrows are held in, uh, held in place. And so we thought we'd try and make it a bit more pro and a bit less, a bit more sustainable. So me and Harry made these like uh, stage one clips in his with his printer and in my garage, and then we developed from there. And then we got we got someone someone else to to print them off, and uh, we did a C trial. They worked. They didn't fall out. They worked well. And then CLDP Brad Marsh took took it on and, and liked the project and now it's fleet wide across the project every boat has them so mm. that was pretty cool to be part of yeah. Yeah, now on. um did you do this out of love just because you love the boat so much or thought we have the perfect solution um no, I only did it. you'll you'll be paying top dollar for these brad <laughs> <laughs> it was basically i get my commission and i got a video made about it that was shared everywhere so that's the only reason i did it uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> of course <laughs> actually Purely for the for the love of the dolphins, mate. That's love right. The dolphins. Oh, oh yeah, of course. You know, that was one thing. And I, when you, you see something and it could be could be a bit more pro, a bit better. It was like mm. you know, there's a lot of thought going into these boats, and there was it was still early days, and it was like, well, if we can make little things better and make them more pro, then let's do it. Yeah, well, well if, done. If you do the timeline, Bicey, Henry came up with this idea. He's he's married to a um, a dolphin trainer, a lady that has a lot of passion for the environment and uh, and the marine space. And uh, I think he was a he was the father of one son um, back in those days. And then the new idea came up. He's he's gone home, told Steph about it, and uh, yeah, now he's Nine got a second. Nine months later, Shazam! Yeah. <laughs> hey, <laughs> easy as that. <laughs> Like, well, easy. That's one idea I've had in in ten years. So, you know, <laughs> <I'm> not... <laughs> at least you rewarded you, mate. That's all I'll say. Um, uh, no, it was good. 
The ironic thing about the dolphin trainer is when I was in the military, that was my go-to chat up line for girls because you have dolphins in, in the military that are trained to scan for mine. You dolphins, mind. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that was like, everywhere I went, I was like, heard about these and, and, I, and I was like, shit, yeah, dolphin trainer. Yeah, and then, oh my God, like you're melting in your hands because you <laughs> dolphin and my mate's flipper and all that, all that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, ironically, I got trapped by a dolphin trainer and she, and she got, the, got the rock on her finger. So there you go. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Hey, uh, actually, speaking of uh, we, one thing about Barker Radius, we do have some passionate supporters, uh, and probably you know the guy that fights for the number one role in that is a bloke called John Schaefer, um, who. Now we promise none of this will go to air. But what's he really <laughs> like in real life, Henry? <laughs> well, Does he deserve to get Listener of the Year? That's what I'm asking. <laughs> I think I think he could definitely be in the nominees for Lifter of the Year, if, if not take. He, he was a really nice guy. Like you guys put me on to him. He came down. He's obviously doing some great things with the Swim of the Watch um, uh, course that he's doing, qualification. And I was really when you when you when I heard about it from you guys, it was really interesting to see what he was doing. And he was he's a local boy from Shanty, uh, Chicago, so he came down to Chicago. We tried to drown him as hard as we could on your boy's call, but unfortunately he managed to get the uh, black air. rubber thing. Mm. The black rubber. Yeah. Um, seemed, seemed quite comfortable with that in his mouth. Uh, <laughs> he, and he survived. So he, he, he then got, we got him out on the boat with Tommy Ella. Tommy Ella, another legend of the, the trade on the court, our chief marshal here. And he, and he got to see what it was about from their side of things. And then he went on a, on a, on, he had a I think he had quite a good weekend. Yeah, good. Um, and it was good to see what he was doing because we were kind of doing the similar thing at the minute uh, with, uh, with Cell GP and making sure we have SAPs and set qualifications and everything it was really black and white, you know, to make sure everyone was trained in the right way. Uh, and then for the biggest part, you know, to make sure the safety side of it, that no, no lives are lost and minimum damage mm-hmm. is done. Um, so that was really, yeah, he, he was a great guy. I had a, had a drink with him afterwards. Really genuine guy. He's, he's an ex military guy as well. So yeah. it yeah. was, uh, All right. John, was good. you survive Appreciate another that. week. Oh, well, mate. There's a, the reason yeah. I brought it up is because when he, we got him on the show and he gave away a hundred of his rescue swimmer manuals. Like he, he, you know, cause he's quite passionate about it. And he sent me a note. I don't know if you got it as well, boss, but he sent a note during the week. You, I think you're broken down in the defender somewhere. Um, probably. Yeah. Yeah. So, He's been quite passionate about the whole um, that rescue swimmer and getting it out there, and now he's done a whole bunch of videos on it. And um, he he did send a note, and I'm pretty sure uh, that he's put it out live. So uh, yeah, he's film. Here we go. I found the note. He's done all the modules for the rescue swimmer. It's so important that all modules are online free. We want to make it available for all. So we will. We will still charge for the certification, but the certification must be hosted by a club, which then retains seventy percent of the revenue. Um, thanks for you guys too. You've inspired me to do better. So on his website, there you go. Cool is that? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, um, I don't. I just listen to the year just for that for being mm-hmm. so, so the, uh, for the industry, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'd just go to Ministry of Sailing and and uh, have a look. But yeah, if you want to do that rescue swimmer and oh, Parko in shot before he he was rescue swimmer on uh, on uh, for the, his boats on the ocean race. So Parko was always been thrown into the ocean. Um, I think maybe just because they're trying to get rid of him. But <laughs> 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 don't tell him I said that. It was a joke, all right? Uh, yeah. We'll yeah. see Jordan next uh, next round with a pretty fat jaw. Yeah, from Parker. That's mm, right. It'll match the rest yeah. of your noggin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies, mate. It was just a joke. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, now we have to we have to be difficult for you, my friend. So GP, you know, like there's been a couple of crashes. There's been uh, there's been the flips. There's been uh, the the circumcision of Team Japan. Um, there's, there's where you've been doing some dredging work in Copenhagen. You, what's going on? The dredging uh, oysters, <laughs> bloody oysters in Copenhagen. <laughs> let me tell you, was the fall there's a lot thing. going on. <laughs> hey, uh, Henry, what are you doing? I'm just shaping this like an oyster dredge. <laughs> By the way, I heard there's some over there. Yeah, exactly. It's back to the farm, farm of working boat routes. Exactly. <laughs> under sale wasn't it yeah um 
yeah, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of collateral damage over over the few seasons. I, I think a lot of it's to do with the guys like sailing very aggressively, really wanting to win. You know that you know like anything in these boats being, you know, going back to the cup when these boats were sailed. You know there weren't wasn't anywhere near as many boats on the start line. The nature of the course, the nature of um, the pressure of competition. You know, and just pushing things as hard as possible. And uh, you know, there's a lot there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, push on the media side of the best sailor in the world and all this thing and you know people mm. claiming it not claiming it and i think you know that probably probably uh a factor in some of the guys minds who are, who are driving these boats and you know um just pushing boundaries i suppose trying to trying to get the best out of your boat and and uh and yeah a bit of bit of luck or unluck unlucky as, as the case may be um gelling as a team you know some guys have had lots of changes in teams and they you know that that probably it's probably hard to to not have to, to have con- continuity of the same guys sailing all the time and how they work with each other and you know um yeah they're also they're also bloody fast boats and you know the reaction time of them and things like that and the visibility of them sometimes can be a little bit hard with uh displays and things and looking getting to trying to look through the wing and you know so Speaking of the whole gelling thing, um, you've probably you've probably witnessed it, especially the last, let's say the last season and definitely started this season, there's quite the dominance from the Aussies and the Kiwis weren't really to be seen. Whereas yep. now we've just seen the Kiwis take out the last two, right? Is that yeah, what that, would you put that down to? Is that think, gelling as a team? It's that's... just that extra little percent that they needed? Yeah, I think well the Kiwis have generally always been really good in the teamwork side of things and getting people, you know, a really good bunch of lads uh, in in most Kiwi teams that have been around. Um, I think there's definitely an element of that. They they seem like a real solid unit from the outside, you know. Um, and I, I as I understand it, they've just kind of done it their own way when lots of other teams have just been watching and obviously they all get the, the data from each other of what the other teams are doing in certain manoeuvres and I'm sure they've used that to some extent. Uh, bringing in razors probably probably been a massive mm. thing for them, you know. Uh, yeah, um, but yeah, and and time, you know, time will tell. Everyone when they first get in these boats is a little bit, you know, a little bit loose. And over time, they, you, you know, you see what the other boats are doing. You can, but I think, like you, like you, you basically nailed it. Then the gel, the gelling side of it, those guys are solid, you know, and uh, you know the, that 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 is a massive part of it as well as the performance side of it. And that, so they can just relax and get on with it. Very relaxed on the boat. You listen to the comms on their boat compared to some of the other boats. There's hardly ever any effing or screaming or you know. So you know, if something goes wrong, Pete's very, very, um, very calm and very. Oh, okay, yep. I, that happened. I, I do yep. laugh because I reckon some of the comms that come through your earpiece <laughs> in Sail GP could be quite fruity at times. <laughs> If, if you only, if yeah, there's plenty of swearing going on in our boat sometimes, you know. Uh, it's a very passionate team, so uh, there's uh, yeah, luckily we don't have a swear box. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what, what are you seeing here for France? I just had a look at the weather earlier, it could look a bit light and uh, kind of westerly over the weekend. Willing to, change. yeah, fruity Friday. And then Saturday, Sunday is going to be uh, lightish. Uh, yeah. Back on beyond the LABs, uh, light airboards, and the big wing. We're yeah. big wing to start, I think, on Thursday, and then Friday we're we're going uh, middle wing, and then uh, HSBs, and then the chat is on Friday. Oh, on Saturday, Sunday for racing, it's LABs and the large wing. So, but obviously things can change. Oh, last love- year, last. Here with the uh, swell, you get all the chop from all the, all the super yachts about in the bay, and it just bounces off each corner. And it was quite, quite, quite a quite a uh, experience being out there in, in swell with these boats, light wind yeah. and swell. Just for the listeners, HSB high speed board, LAB Sorry. light air light board. Sorry, <laughs> the um, rudders, the rudder have two different sizes for those as well yeah. that can be interchanged. Yeah. Uh, we we we've had a few people write in, so sometimes you guys just too much. There was just too tight to it all. But um, now one of the things before you know, like you're in the build up at the moment, is recording this, and we'll publish this straight away. So um, next weekend is Sail uh, GP. One of my roles, I, I'm in floating around with you guys quite a bit in the build up and on the in the mornings. One of my favourite things, my friend, is watching you come out on the boat. To the crane, where you you stand. 
the Roman chariot. You look like a charioteer, mate. You look like a charioteer just giving directions. Yeah. It's, it's... I, I tell you what, I've been, given, I've been get, get more shit from doing that role than anyone, everyone else around the around the, <laughs> the, I ever done doing that role in my life. It's unreal. Least, yeah, because basically, we found it. We found it. So it's a great thing to have someone on the platform just guiding the guys when because we push the boats around by hand when we're going out to the crane and coming back, uh, and getting back in the shed and coming under the wing when we're when we're due to launch. A lot of bar karate going on here. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, good. I love it. Uh, yeah, and so I kind of jump up on the jump up on the boat, large and in charge. Maybe not so large, but in charge anyway, and, and crack the whip and get the guys pushing oh, pushing oh, the oh, pushing in on thing and. Yeah, it's my moment of glory. So, well, day. this specifically called when people take the piss a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah. The best yeah. thing to do is absolutely own it. Own so, it. Oh, if we I mean. do not see on the weekend mm-hmm. you dressed in a full garb of white with an actual whip and but playing Julius Caesar, something's wrong, man. You need oh, to own I, this. Definitely see me cracking the whip. I always give it one of those when people give me shit, but get my chariot again. <laughs> Giddy up, giddy up. I've probably got two grinders at the back of the boat as well. So. Feed, and when I finish this, feed me some bloody grapes, will you? Yeah. <laughs> well, look. Bring, give guys an isotonic sport drink, <laughs> feed me some grapes, calm me down. Okay. Well, he, here we go. I'll, I'll give you the challenge. So your social media team, they're, they're obviously looking for ideas because, you know, Sal GP are always looking to put out stuff. So one, I'll give you a bunch of things for the social media team one obviously the grapes get him lying on the tramp after <laughs> and just having a few people feeding him grapes <laughs> two get the the charioteer helmet and just get some yes. video footage of him doing that the other thing yeah, we looks, get, a, huh? get a broomstick and down and put it on a put it on one of my helmets yep. or a dustpan or something yeah that, that would work it, it looks like a it looks like a tabernacle as well so you could get the priest garb and you could be just you know Doing a sermon from the uh, the tabernacle there, <laughs> we just come up with some ideas, and every week you put up a new one. You could just got to come up with ten ideas, and every stopover you've got Henry in a different outfit from the uh, the 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 king position, mate. We love it, love it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> it doesn't sound like he's going to embrace it, mate. No, no, oh. Cheval Blanc, we could call it the Cheval Blanc. <laughs> just pulling. That's all I want to. Pulling the boat out by a couple of white horses. <laughs> we'll see what we see what we can do. I'm sure we can do some sort of, some sort of funny or gift yeah. or something. I don't know. If you've got the Think chariot helmet on, hopefully put get a horse head and stick it on one of the guys at the front. That'd yeah, be no, hilarious. that probably wouldn't go down too well. The horse's head because in France, <laughs> yeah. so everyone would be eating it. <laughs> get my leg chopped off to try and <laughs> chark it. Uh, cool. Hey, um. I noticed, uh, what's Robert now? Is he 10 or 11? Is he? What's he about that? 10 and Maximus, my youngest, is one. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I noticed he, uh, he's he got the engineer. I want to be an engineer, I think he put up just the other day. Yeah. Is that inspired by what he's seeing you do? Oh, possibly. I think he's, he's yeah, he he does he does one of those every year when he goes to school and yeah and he's been he's last year he wanted to be a motorcycle racer and this year he's an engineer but uh, but it always seems connected with some sort of motors or engineering and mm. yeah he he's obviously for the circuit and he's had base tours and I've shown him round and dressed him up dressed in Plymouth it was great to have him down there and got him dressed up in my my safety gear as well and and he seems really interested in that side of things science and engineering and yeah for sure I, I I'd love to think that it is from what I do and and that that's inspired him because you know. He's my hero. So oh, hopefully if you can it. do that, that's great. So if he said, you know, Dad, I want to do do the same thing, want to work the boats, would you be happy with that or do you think it's a challenging life? No, I'd kick him out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'd embrace it. I, I, I you know, I, I, sometimes, you, you know, you, you get a little bit um, – complacent with what you're doing and you find yourself having a whinge about what's going on around you and this isn't good enough or that's not good enough and then you take a step back and go bloody hell you know i'm going going to all these places around the world i still get time off at home in between getting paid a decent salary so if he wants to take it on then yeah I, i'm all for it for sure I, I'd, 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 I'd any kids that want to get out there and get traveling get involved in the shore crew side of it and just take it on and, and get into it because it's it, it's a great life you might your wife might not say that but but you know <laughs> They won't complain when they're, when they're, you know, it, but it's, it, it's great. 
it working away for me is great. It's always been part of my life since I was a, uh, an 18 year old, basically. And, and sit in. It's, it's good, but you need to find an understanding wife for sure. <laughs> I love it. Uh, cool. Mate, uh, we're just about done on time. So I'll just throw it to Boss. You got anywhere you want to go next, mate? Well, I do, but probably not for the airwaves. Oh. So we <laughs> might hold that for another version of Barkarati <laughs> behind the scenes. But, um, mate, you have perfectly rounded off and echoed a lot that I've been banging on about for quite some time on the show. Um, and just specifically that, that, that last little bit there, if you kids out there or anyone out there for that matter who wants to take it, just take it on. I mean, yeah, yeah. it's what's oh, the worst thing that's going to happen. So, and we've been lucky enough to see some pretty good stories come out of Bark Radio and people kind of getting a little bit inspired and, going towards the the boating scene for that matter but as for becoming a shore crew you need that that element of being happy living out of people's back pockets all those sorts of things which you do very well so thanks for joining henry no thank you gents it's been an absolute pleasure yeah uh, that's that's great hey, appreciate b- before us before we sign off but uh, who's sponsoring the uh, french event uh Range Rover. Range Rover, right? That it wasn't that. No, it was Land Rover that made the Defender. I was just kind of... and but they they didn't make it. They broke down on the way, so they had to get Range Rover. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, I love no, it. No. It suits the rosé drinking. <laughs> yeah, like water here. Definitely got a bit of pink dust this morning. So, mm. but no, it's all it's all good. Uh, yeah, I if you can. Well, while well, you're there, if you can pick up my credit card at Cafe de Paris, um, please <laughs> do so. I strategically leave it there. It gets you in the next day, no problem. Perfect, mate. No worries. Cool. All right, bud. We'll catch you. Thanks, Henry. Cheers, Cheers mate. Have a great yep. weekend. Thanks, guys. Nice one. Um. One of the good ones, Jordan. Yeah. On Henry. Yeah. Um, and I mean, a good one for us also to do, like as self confess, not really the racer of whom we generally interview, but someone who makes up eighty percent of what happens in the real world, yeah. especially at that at that um the pro end of the game. Because what you see on the water is a small, small percentage of what really goes on. And you need guys like that, guys like Henry with his enthusiasm and his keenness to make shit happen, of yep. which he does. Yeah, he's got he's got a boundless energy, that lad. Yeah, Just, a valuable all... part of the boatyard when mm. that was all mm. put together. And, um, mm. you know, he was, well, and you now see where these guys are now. It's mm. bloody fantastic. He described himself as a happy hooligan, and that's probably the best, mm. best description of a bloke I've ever heard. <laughs> Could probably get a little bit looser at times, yeah. I'd, I'd say, but yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it. No. Uh, Good. Very cool. Um, cool. All right. Well, well done, Henry. Thanks for joining us, mate. Love chatting again. Um, it's good to see a bloke doing so well. And uh, he does. He embraces the environmental side as well in a massive way. Mm, so Yes. Um, club events. Got one for you. Mm-hmm. Got one for you indeed. Young. Do tell. Um, Rob Cumin. All right. Even pre- obviously, we've mispronounced his name a few times. What? Q mine. Yeah. <laughs> Q mine. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, he's he's actually put the pronunciation there. Hobart is opening uh, their season. Uh, they've got the pipe opener on the sixteenth to eighteenth September, the Southern Tasmania sailing season. Uh, yes. Afternoon night race. Usual Friday night party. Live bands, fire pit, shenanigans, Saturday afternoon, race in the channel, different courses for the categories. Racing in the channel can be challenging with different tides and winds. And then Sunday, a race back to Hobart. Always a great event. All different mm. yachts, crew expense is a great way to shake out the boats and cobwebs. How about that? That's a great, sounds like a great event to be involved in. Um, in fabulous Tasmania, which I spent all week in, and Rob did reach out, and we never quite hooked up. I sent, he sent me a note. I said oh, it'd be available bugger. Thursday night. Yeah, right. And um, no, we didn't. Uh, we didn't get in touch. 
which is a bit of a habit of mine, I'll be honest. I'm not the world's greatest at that these days, getting old. Um, anyway. You know what? We've got to spend more time in Tasmania. Um, I saw the week in Hamo and SMB with Troy Grafen from yep. um, down there, yep. who and they're just a bunch of good bastards yeah, too, yeah. down there. It's, so it's good. Um, good. We look forward to going live. Actually, mm. Sharpie Nationals could be an opportunity. Mm. Um, mm. Oh, this year being held down in Tassie. So cool. Yeah, good place. I can make that happen. Just got. I just got to bloody make it to Hobart one day. We'll see. <laughs> 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 the boy who never would make it. All right. <laughs> Jack Lloyd, listener of the week. Um, have you got any nominations? Because I reckon I've got a no-brainer. Um, nothing that stood out as such, let me say that. Um, but do tell. Do tell, my friend. Mike Khalil from Colorado. He says hello from Colorado. Fantastic place for those who have mm-hmm. never been to Colorado. Absolutely fantastic place. Loves our podcast. Became an advert listener over the last year. Turned some of his crew onto the pod as well. This past weekend, his club hosted the 51st annual Dillon Open Regatta on Lake Dillon, Colorado. We sail at 9,017 feet above sea level. And happy to claim the rights of having America's highest yacht club. Don't misinterpret that. Um, Altitude. Uh, our club has great size, all kinds of different backgrounds. About 50 boats turned out for the event, and I think it was great success. We had fleets of Etchells, uh, uh, J22s, J24s, Catalina 22s, Melders 24s, and J80s as well as PHRF, mm. including a Melders 32. He wanted to share a picture of a modification one of his crew members made to the sign for the bar tent. I'm sure you can see where this is going. He added blue tape spelling out karate with an arrow pointing to the social <laughs> talent. Oh, I thought it was brilliant. Please have a look at their taps picture and feel free to share it on your socials. So I have already put that up on uh, the Insta page, just announcing yes. that. And he's put the boot into me as well. Um, I saw a J80 and was a little disappointed a couple of weeks ago when you questioned whether or not they even had a J80 Worlds any longer. The Worlds are coming up in Newport, Rhode Island at the beginning of October and currently 48 boats are registered. Many teams travelling from Europe. So please, in the future, try to show some respect for this early mm. sports boat. Damn right, Mike. You yes. couldn't, couldn't have said it better myself. About <laughs> time you did some more research, Jordan. <laughs> Fair mm. enough. I take that one. I think, uh, in all honesty, at my response was are they it was like i was asking myself a question rather than questioning the class but uh, fair yeah. enough well fair enough. i know and specific it does confuse me a little bit but when you look up to the left i know your line when you look up to the <laughs> right i know you're questioning yourself right yeah. so whereas i don't know what you've got your computer set to whether <laughs> whether it mirrors or not so mike i'm sorry mate that was my mistake <laughs> it's mirrored it's mirrored uh I just, just want to quickly, uh, one person we're very fond of is Denise Del Mundo and she, she got uh, her friend Randy sent in a big note about her a few months ago and she sent in a really lovely letter to us. We haven't had time to reply to you, but we've read it, Denise, and it's, yep. uh, it's super cool. And, uh, you know, warms the cockles, Denise. Warms the cockles. We're fans. And we, yep. she said some absolutely lovely things in that, so I just wanted to mention that we've read it. Of course, we've taken note of it. But uh, for the purposes of this week, much to your disappointment, Denise, you are not the listener of the week. It's going to Mike Khalil. Well, she's already – she's currently FLOTW, right? That's right. She keeps it yeah, – it's on her <laughs> sign-off. That's exactly right. Very cool. Olé, 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 olé. Hot, hot, hot. It's hot time with Bice. Feeling hot. Rightio, Jordan, mm-hmm. got a little quiz for you. Uh-oh. What does Mark Mills, mm-hmm. Ken Reid, mm-hmm. Tommaso Kieffi mm-hmm. all have in common? Well, the obvious one is flying knicker. It's, um, no. Well, the obvious one was they've all been on bar karate. Oh. So that's it. <laughs> Moving on. Um <laughs> No, um, uh, Maxi Worlds. 
this week. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Costa yeah. Esmeralda Yacht Club. Yeah. At time of recording, they would literally be in the Straits of Madalena on day one yeah, yeah. of the world's 50-plus boats. Mm. And what I found quite striking here, mm. you've got everything from the 1930s J-Class mm. Vashita mm. up to the Flying Nika. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I mean, absolute classic to pretty much the what you would say the most technically technology technically advanced boat mm. who can sail in a fleet like that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm pretty keen to keep an eye on this and wow. what's going to be happening flight like breeze wise and all that sort of stuff because it could be bloody interesting. There could be some big. I kind of I guess I refer to flying Nika here a little bit. There could be some big crashes and bangs if yeah. it's blowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, what a place to do it, Costa Smelda. Yeah, yeah. Well, the other one, you know, amongst all the spam email we get, we get we get some spam email from Norta Swan, and um, mm. who just launched, you know, well through Persica Marine, the Swan Eighty, which will yes, be there. my song, my song, and. That's a cool boat too. I mean, Cam Appleton, I think. Or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, and a few others. So, yeah, they it, send it us is. A, they sent us a little video, and it was sexy as hell. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of which, you may remember when we went to that little pizza bar, mm-hmm. and we did meet the world's second sexiest lady mm-hmm. there, who sat next to us, who happened to be an Aussie. Yes. And she gave you all your Instagram tips. So. Thanks very much. Um, oh, what was her name? She was a yoga chick. Mm, God, that Belinda was impressive. Something. We should we should tell anyway, the listeners. I'm that sure story she doesn't listen anymore. No. So, but um, little shout out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we've got the uh, Maxi Worlds going on. As I said at the start of the show, mate, it's it's all happening. You got the Maxi Worlds. You got the Soul GP happening. France, yeah. This weekend, so there is there's enough time. Oh, Maxwell's finished Saturday, I think. So there is a slight clash. Mm. So not the perfect timing. But the a week or two after that, then you've got the Laval Saint Tropez anyway. So a lot of mm. those boats will be making their way over. Mm. So it's a busy, busy time yeah. in that part of the Mediterranean. Fantastic time. Yeah, obviously it'd be uh, be very cool. Um, what else? What else you got? Anything else? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I've got to find my notes here again. <laughs> I spent a lot of time on this. I thought I did pretty well getting flying nicker. I thought I, I've nailed that. Yeah, but- no, that was a good one. Um, okay, when is the Bar Karate Curse not the Bar Karate Curse? Mm. The Clayton's Bar Karate Curse, we'll call it, uh, is uh, unfortunately taking place this week with our mate Joel. Yeah, the Forty Nine er Worlds. Yeah. Um, I was a little confused with actually the split between gold and silver fleet because um, they were on less points than some that made it into the gold fleet unless there was a mistake mm. from what I saw. Mm. But um, that was a pity. The Aussies, I mustn't – well, apologies to the non-Aussies out there, but yep. obviously that's a bit of an Aussie uh, theme here and I saw their results. We didn't really set the world on fire. No. I wouldn't say no, um, but still saying that we haven't had the um, the medal races at time of recording, so well, that may flip a few things on its head. Yeah, yeah. So in the the forty nine er classes, yeah, she's um, she's looking a bit sus. I think in the forty nine er FX, they're pretty close. So, so it'd be the last day for them, and likely the last day for the forty nine ers as well. But at the moment, the interesting thing is if you are Dutch, um, both. The men and the women in the 49ers is being led by Dutch teams. And mm-hmm. I would suggest that uh, Lambre and uh, Van der Werken will not be losing the men's. Um, the Fantella boys are right behind them and then Diego and Florian, uh, the Spanish team. Then a couple of New Zealand teams. So New Zealand has still got some good form there. But in the uh, in the women's, in the FX, the Anhalt and Deutz, um, looking looking. It's not a, a, a runaway for them. They can still lose it, but uh, looking fairly likely. The other one, though, my friend, mm. uh, I think all the racing's done. Well, the racing's still got to go. We've got another day to go, but I'm willing to call it uh, for uh, Tito and Banty. Um, have you looked at that scorecard in the NACRA no. 17? 
go, go ahead. Um, it's been it's been a bit of an up and down, but they've done okay. Um, first, first, <laughs> Here we go. first, 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 twentieth, first, first, first. First, 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 second. Holy shit. <laughs> yes. I oh, know. And then another... they pull their finger out. <laughs> I think. That that's unbelievable. And another Italian team in second, then the Poms in third. It's an unassailable lead Un- going into the gold race. Unassailable. Is that no, where you cut? It's, it's all done. Done and dusted. Yeah, done and dusted. Bar yeah. the bar the shouting. But it's uh it's interesting that one. I I I uh, phew, what a performance. Uh, our friends Jason Lease uh, in sixth. So the sixth, Aussies. Yeah, correct. Yeah. yeah. And potential cool. could move up. Um, there's another Italian team in fifth. So their squad, whoever's doing that little squad, is doing a great job. Um, mm. That's all I'll say. Mm. Bravo. Mm. Now, uh, I've got one final one here for yeah. Hot Times. Yeah. Um, and parents out there, specifically in Oz, will get this. There's this book or a song out there called The Wonky Donkey. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not entirely sure how you pronounce it in Spanish, but there would have been a lot of people standing on the beach in Barcelona <laughs> and they saw a wonky donkey fall over in a rain squall. Oh, the um, oh. the Swiss America's Cup team mm. had a little mishap mm. during the week, yes, coming in. Their first um, sale, what their sales been up for five minutes or something? Well, yeah, got caught in a rain squall, yeah, yeah. um, and I mean. We could say, you know, watch the weather and blah, blah, blah. But having been there and knowing what can happen in a very, very short amount of time, holding down the fort, oh, scary. scary Must indeed. have been scary. Yeah, yeah no, no criticism extended from us at all. Um, no, not at all. But it's not just sympathy, you know, like what a nightmare for those poor guys and that whole team. Um, they're obviously on the waters early, Um and there's mm. a couple of things that are coming out about Barcelona, obviously, the, the weather like that. It's choppy, you know, like a, there's a bit of a swell run through the course. So it's going to be interesting, this cup. Yeah, yeah. Not to mention <laughs> a lot of the uh, TP guys would get hold of this. When we, <laughs> Not to mention that dude who just walks around with no clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be well into his 80s now. And um, <laughs> you know how things droop. Well, yeah. Mm. Anyway, <laughs> we'll leave it to him. Wow. Oh, I was just going to say you can talk. Adelaide has a renowned person wandering the streets as well. So, remember- yeah. Oh, speaking of which, we better wrap this up. I've got a few things on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, yeah. Sympathies there. Mm. Um, what else have we got? To, just a bunch of things happening. This It's a busy week, as you said. Uh, oh, there's a reminder, Bart's Bash coming up this weekend. Yep. So if you're listening to this during the week of the 5th, 10th and 11th, go to bartsbash.org or something, um, bartsbash.com, check it out. Mate, see if your local club's doing it or a club around you. Get involved. It's all for a fantastic thing, connecting a lot of people and doing all the good things that sailing does. Yeah. So. One, one of our mates... A-M-A-M, Alastair Murray, mm-hmm. A-M, um, yeah. who is the chairman of Ronston. And, yeah. um, um, you know, he's, he gave me some grief during the week. Too much too much Harkin mentions. Um, oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and he, he threatened to uh, to give me some grief if I didn't mention the Taser Worlds. He's a mad, passionate supporter of the Taser, as we know. Yes. So September 17 to 25 in Seattle, Washington. Mm-hmm. The Taser World's coming up, so heads up for that. Just wanted to make people aware of that. Um, a class um, you... is it? Is our friend I am doing the worlds? Actually, I haven't looked. I just or will he be hosting his world famous AMAM sessions mm. after the worlds, where he uh, he grabs the mic, has a little chit chat, mm. tells everyone. You know, a little spins a bit of a yarn here yeah. and there. It spins his. So little, it's got a little propeller cap. He spins around in too. Um, yeah. What else? Uh, so Taser Worlds, the A Class Euros are about to start this week. Um, the Star Plus boats. Yep, Star World Champs start on the eighth. So oh, yeah, that'll go. That goes for about two years. They go on and on. <laughs> Don't worry. We'll we'll mention it in um yeah sometime <laughs> in November when they finally get a winner. <laughs> they keep going. Uh, FD World Champs. Oh mate, too good. 
This, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the old Flying Dutchman, which is just a magnificent boat, uh, particularly for a skipper. Um, so they're underway, I think, starting today, actually. Yeah. Um, so in with Club Verona. You've got Club Verona. So uh, it's a... Uh, it should be a ton of fun for that one. So a lot of respect, mad respect for that that fleet. What else? Uh, that's it, I think. Is there anything else you can think of, Bart Spash? Oh, nothing that um, that my notes that I lost would. <laughs> yeah, there'd probably a whole lot of shitload of stuff on that. But um, no, I think that's it for the week, my friend. Cool. Looking cool. forward to catching up very soon. On uh, we got a pretty good guest coming up next week. Mm. So a young guy. He's doing it all. Mm. Ray got more, uh, not as many flags as Phil Robertson, national flags that is, but he's got a couple. <laughs> yes. So yes. Um, it'll be interesting. Mm. Yeah, cool. All right, listeners, um, BP is due back. We we have been talking to him. He's definitely coming back. Uh, I just, I'm not quite, it's up to him. We'll let him say what's going on. It's, it's entirely in BP's hands and uh, yeah. I think our listeners understand. Oh, it's a tough time, mm. um, and there's a lot going on, so things have to be a little bit uh, looked after. Let's say, yep. um, including our good mate. So, yeah, be good to have him back. But one thing is good: he's still allowed to play his guitar and have a little bit of a sing song. So that's let's... right. Yeah, we get him in just for it. <laughs> so I'll just um, pa- just page. Uh, what do you call it? Um, patch him in. Here patch he is. Patch him in. Oh, okay. Yeah. Patching in BP now and mid chorus. See you, everyone. Have a great week. We're in thrashes. Good. So consistent as well. Don't hear a wave in the voice.